Welcome everyone. Um, Belle and I are really excited to share um, what we do in our experiences here at the Early Childhood Lab at the University of California in Davis. Um, and today we're going to share with you our process and the questions that we asked ourselves when we redesign our curriculum and our learning spaces um, for preschool age children. Um, we use a student-centered coaching model. And after today, we're hoping that you will learn more about how we analyze our curriculum, how we transform the physical environment, the way that we choose and adapt materials and tools, and the supports that we embed for the adults around children as they explore the spaces, explore their curiosities and interests, and engage in um, STEAM um, for all learners, those with and without disabilities. And so we wanted to just describe who we are since we um, are in the preschool world and not within a public school, but um, within a university lab school setting. So um, I will start. I, hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us and choosing our room. My name is Bella. I graduated from UC Davis with a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Policy Analysis, uh, but I specialized and studied child development and early outdoor education. So that's how I found my way to this space. So now I work as a lead teacher in our early childhood lab at, on campus at UC Davis. And I have a long history of working in public schools, mainly with children with disabilities as a school-based occupational therapist. And I've been working here at the University of California in Davis since um, September. So new to the space and new to this collaboration with Bella. We also wanna to get to know you and um, I, if you can put in the chat, sort of what your setting is, what your superpower, what's your superpower that you bring into collaborative relationships um, and why you chose this session or what you hope to get out of it. And we were hoping that perhaps at least two people could unmute themselves and share, um, share your, um, your superpower that you bring and what you hope to get out of this. If we could get two volunteers to unmute yourself. All right. And Bella, I might need your help in managing the chat. I'm having a little bit of difficulty sort of seeing if people are. Oh, I can help you do that. That's, that's oh. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's um, see. Do you want me to read out anything or do you, how can I help you? No, I can see it now. I can see it now. I just can't see anybody's faces. That's new for me. So mm -hmm. um, is there anyone that would like to share with us your superpower that you bring to collaborative relationships? Or why you chose the session? Hi, I'm just going to mute myself. My name is Shay Fairchild, and I am a TOSA in the Norwalk La Mirada Unified School District. And um, uh, my superpower is I like to bring laughter. I just want people to have fun. I don't like, I try to make it um, as light as possible, especially when having tough conversations. Um, and I, you know, when you asked what I'm getting out of this session, um, to be honest, I, I was interested in seeing just how your process was on looking at um, the curriculum that you have. That's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And is there anyone else? If not, we can move on. Yes. And thank you for sharing. Um, Ruth Molina wrote that her superpower is connecting staff to social to the social emotional component and that's why you chose this session so thank you for that um, as well so i'm gonna go ahead 
and go on to how Bella and I work together. And I'll hand it off to Bella to kind of describe that. Yeah. So, you know, the main thing that we really want to emphasize is we work together, but it's also acknowledge that we do have. So Eva is this big picture person in the space and she does the large group curriculum planning. Uh, she also does specific small group things, both for the children and for the undergrads that we work with. And she observes the undergrads that are doing their lab practicum in our lab, provides direct instruction and guidance to support the implementation of the skills that we expect them to leave with at the end of the quarter. Uh, me, as a lead teacher, I plan more of the large group learning for the children. I prepare materials that will support them in this planning. I lead the children and the caregivers, which are the undergrads, through those activities. And I try to be a model and provide the undergrads with cues and direction. But above all, what we do together is we work on our curriculum and we evaluate how efficient it is for our children specifically in terms of engagement and impact on child development. So although Bella and I have these different roles and responsibilities, we really use a student-centered approach to our collaboration um, and we work on our curriculum map. And that's really gonna be the focus today. And so Bella's gonna just sort of walk us through how we start, where we start um, in our curricular map. Yeah, so this right here, what you're seeing on the screen is our curriculum map and it, consists of these several different learning areas of both our indoor and our outdoor classrooms. So today we're going to address the spaces in our indoor classroom and how we work together in designing them. So we use an emergent curriculum style that focuses on art, science, math, building, books, dramatic play, music, and movement, and then of course our outdoor spaces. Uh, but now we actually have a question for you all again. So please feel free to unmute or put in the chat. But we're wondering how much opportunity do you all have to adapt and personalize your curriculum or what you use in your learning spaces? So if you can unmute or type in the chat, that'd be super helpful for us to also guide and know how much impact, um, how much adaptability and room for that there is for you. Well, I know in, in our district, um, you know, we have set curriculum that we can embellish, but we're expected to follow the scope and sequence of that curriculum so that there's kind of equity between schools because we have 15 elementary schools and kids go back and forth all the time. So the worry is if people are creating their own things, then they, they'll miss out if they move to another school. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing that. And families do speak to each other. So, um, you know, even if you have families that live in different neighborhoods, um, yeah, I've worked with a lot of administrators who, um, yeah, that's a, that's a concern. And so um, thank you for sharing that. Anyone else um, with respect to um, how you're able to personalize or can you personalize your curriculum? So Georgia and I work in the same school district. We're both from Palm Springs Unified. Um, so yes, we do have a, a so, scope and sequence and, and adopted curriculum that we're supposed to use. And yet I feel like over the past few years, the emphasis has been more on um, teaching the standards and less on let's all turn the page on the same day. Let you know, it's been less of that. So there's been more, gradually more freedom in my opinion. Yeah, that's great to hear. And I apologize, Bella, I moved up the slide. Um, but Bella, as Bella mentioned, we are really fortunate that we are able to have an emergent curriculum and draw from many different research bases um, in order to individualize our curriculum to the interests and needs of the children in our spaces. So um, here's an overview of our process that Bella's going to explain. Yeah, so an overview is we observe 
reflect, and create. So we allot time to closely observe our children, including how much they use the different spaces in our indoor and outdoor classroom. We reflect weekly on what we notice and take notes in regard to children engagement and participation in these different learning areas. We plan to create immediate tweaks when needed, um, but then every three weeks, we completely change our curriculum focus based on the children's interest and their developmental progressions and hope to guide and just dive deeper onto that. So as Stella just mentioned, our starting point is observation. And um, we are observing children all the time, seeing what their interests are, seeing how they manipulate material, see, you know, writing down what questions they're asking. We ask our undergraduate students who serve um, as student caregivers for particular children to really write down what they're hearing children say as they explore both the indoor and outdoor spaces. Um, and we do this process continuously so that every three weeks our spaces are changed and we keep that dynamic um, curiosity and that trying to lead children through their developmental progressions, looking at the preschool learning frameworks um, in order to um, continue to have them develop and grow in all areas of um, their development. Yeah, and so like we've said, and I've mentioned indoor and outdoor classroom a lot, but here we go again, we closely observe them in both of those spaces and to make, to further our adaptations based off the results of our observations. So we ask questions like, how are the children using the space? Who are they playing with? Are they playing with friends? Or is this space making them want to play on their own? What kind of conversations are they having? How are children able to access the materials? Yvette is just magnificent and amazing at accessibility and has so many good questions to ask when looking at the space. We also ask what conflicts come from their play in this space. Are we creating conflict? Is there, is there no conflict? Are we giving them space to build through problem solving? And our last question is, how are they exploring the space? So if you look on the picture to the right, we have a child who's actively engaged in exploring in the sand and the water. And then if you look a little bit farther in the background, you see a child that is just observing. And we want to know, is this a pattern? Are there sensory processing concerns that are creating barriers for children? Are they just observers or are they engaged? And so much of what we do falls under this umbrella of STEAM. Um, as children explore, as they problem solve, as they play, and we're really trying to encourage children to um, engage in collaborative problem solving um, by how we set up the environment. So we're also looking at those things as well. And so we have a video for you to watch. Um, and we want to think, we want you to think about the questions that Bella just reviewed. So, you know, how do the children use the space? How are they playing with the materials? What conversations are they having either with them, you know, among themselves or with um, the adults? How are the adults um, really encouraging children to think about their designs um, as they're building? And then maybe what are some of the, what are some factors here that might be creating barriers for their engagement in, um, in STEAM activities? And here, particularly in looking at engineering um, as they build with um, open-ended materials. So I'm going to start the video. It's just about a minute and 45 seconds. And again, we just want you to think about, you know, the questions we ask ourselves and what additional questions would you have as you um, are looking at the space and the engagement. Closer to you so you don't have to move so far away. Oh, what are you doing? There we go. Now it's not going to be red, easily. Nice and easy. Where are the sleeves? You want some more pieces? Yeah. So, this is what you want. Hello. 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 Hello.
All right, and the, the audio is a little bit low on my end. So um, one of the things that um, the child that you see right here in the striped sweatshirt, she put her hands over her head at the end and said, this is so good. She was really proud of her um, building. And again, this is a little bit on a tangent, but this is really where you can see the um, development of um, persistence, of um, feeling that sense of empowerment and proud of herself. And, you know, STEAM is such a wonderful vehicle for social emotional development and that sense of self and that sense of agency. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has any additional questions they would ask or anything that if you're looking at the environment or looking at the way the materials are set up, um, how did that promote or maybe detract from children's engagement in this activity? And you could just unmute yourself. So I felt like the volume was a bit barrier for me to understand what was really happening in this. Okay. I did notice that the adult that was sitting there mm -hmm. was not just dumping all of the available pieces on the table. She was seemed like in some strategic fashion, giving them enough to work with without overwhelming them with materials. Right. And thank you for noticing that. Yes, that um, and that's something that we like when we're doing our observations, we pick up. So we do ask um, our student caregivers to sort of hold items and, and so that children can engage, they can think more intentionally about what they need. Um, and certainly um, I think that did help um, with this activity. Um, and yes, I do apologize the the audio was a little bit um, difficult to capture. Um, what about just the physical layout? Does anyone have any thoughts about that? I just wanted to add, um, my population of students is mostly second language learners, mm -hmm. and I really liked um, the communication um, and the discussion that was taking place. Um, and the little girl saying, can I make another one, like, you know, using full sentences and all that sort of thing, which is huge for our population. Yes, and so... Thank you for noticing that as well. And we do have some children like this child who's using those full sentences, modeling that language for other children in our group. And, and we do try to very intentionally make these small groupings um, in order to have children um, learn from each other as well. Um, one thing that I noticed and that, you know, this is sort of the, a little sneak peek into the process when we use observation is that, you know, having all four children and um, the adults at the table, it did seem that maybe for some children, they didn't feel like they had enough space to really build what they wanted to. Um, I, I thought that in particular with the child who was sort of at the head of the table and he was leaning on the table with his materials. Um, he's usually a very um, enthusiastic builder. And so that I thought perhaps the small space um, I wonder what he would do if we were to be able to spread out on the floor more and, and engage in those materials. Um, anything else? And thank you for your patience with the audio. Um, something, something, sorry to add really quick back on that video. If you notice, there was some children standing and some children sitting. And I think it's important, and we talk about that in our space too, that not everyone has to sit at a table. Maybe their body it's not ready for that. And maybe they need space to build and, and it's okay to stand in our class. You don't have to be seated at the table. You can stand at the table. 
Um, but then diving into our next step of reflection. So each week we meet to share these observations that we made. So everything that you all observed during this video and you sharing with that, that with us, we got to see different pieces of the puzzle. And these conversations are centered around the children and they provide us with a framework for planning our next curriculum map. We bring our strengths to these conversations. We work together. So I am able to bring my really close relationships that I build with the children being in the classroom every single day and my passion for outdoor education and early outdoor learning. And Yvette's perspectives draw from an inclusive framework that looks at accessing children's uh, children's ability to access spaces and their opportunities to engage in various areas in our indoor and outdoor classroom. We both make different observations, just like everyone did today. So it's really vital to do this part of reflection so that we can put all these little pieces together and come up with a next step together. And so when we are reflecting, we ask ourselves these essential questions. And these are things that we sort of do just really naturally, but they're always on our mind. So one of the things that we ask ourselves is how are our areas interrelated? We know from research that children with disabilities um, really benefit from having opportunities to generalize um, different skills and different concepts in, in multiple areas and in multiple contexts. So in terms of you know, this is an example um, of a cross-cutting concept of patterns. Um, we, in our science areas, had in the, the beginning of the fall, we had lots of different natural materials that each had a different pattern. So we had pine cones, we had leaves. Um, in our music and movement, we also chose songs that had particular rhythms and had patterns, repeating patterns, as well as in our math area, we not only showed you know, different shapes, but we had encouraged children to explore how to put those shapes together um, to integrate them to make a whole picture. Um, and then we also try to connect that cross-cutting um, concept of patterning into our outdoor spaces. And again, here in the early childhood lab, we are very fortunate to have a wonderful outdoor space that just provides us lots of different opportunities to connect um, this concept of patterns for the children. So we have a bamboo forest and here's a picture of bamboo and you can see how symmetrical the lines are and the patterns. And so we'll ask children about that and, and listen and take note of what they say um, and then point out the patterns that we see as well. Another question that we ask ourselves is how is how are we organizing the indoor spaces in order to promote that access to materials and opportunities for explore. Again, coming from an inclusive framework, some children will have more difficulty pulling things out. So we look at, you know, for some of our building areas in the classroom, like, do we have enough space? Are children able to really sort of take the materials and their interests and really expand on it, not just with materials like these big blocks that are shown, but also with each other. Is it too cramped that there's not enough space for all the children? As Bella mentioned, we are always encouraging children to have alternatives to sitting. As an occupational therapist myself, I really prefer children to be in an upright position, to have things hanging on the walls and writing where their eyes and their hands are in the same plane. Um, so we really encourage alternatives to sitting and we'll put materials up so that they can stand. And then how are children able to access materials, pull them out? Um, are we having things up too high? Are they too low that they're not even looking at them? Um, do we need to, do we have enough bins um, so that, and they're not so full to the top. So children can just pull things out on their own and explore their interests. One thing that we're not gonna do today, um, but I think it's something that would be wonderful to do in your spaces is to just go around, get low and notice what would a child see. For Bella and I, this is so extremely important because the way that we place materials, um, we find that perhaps some children are drawn to some materials or others, or maybe we like took a material and kind of hid it and children can't see it. So we will oftentimes get low and go around our different learning areas 
to get that perspective of what would our children see when they're coming into this new space. And then another essential question we ask ourselves is what are those materials that are really gonna encourage and get children excited to engage in STEAM content? So we look at their interests, we look at what activities they're doing indoors and outdoors, and we look at what are those materials that can be the most accessible to children. So for example, we just did a whole unit in our science area on gears, and we had children who putting the gears in were, was a little bit difficult, but then when they used the real tool of a um, of a hand mixer with a gear that was the simple tool to move it, they were just exploring, moving that around, accessing that because it was easier for them just from a fine motors perspective. Um, here's another example of how we build in children's interests. Um, our children, this particular child was so interested in building homes for different animals and habitats. And so we were um, encouraging him to build habitats for different animals we have in the block space, as well as um, looking at our outdoor spaces. Um, we create with the other classroom created a fairy garden and what do the fairies need in this garden? Um, what are we going to have for them? And they use all these um, natural materials to sort of create food, shelter um, for the fairies in the garden space. We also have noticed that children really enjoy, there are some materials that children just gravitate to and really enjoy. So like Play-Doh. So we'll use those for different purposes and for different reasons. So on the left-hand side, you'll see children with um, mats and they're creating faces. And on the right, you see children that they're making recipes with different Play-Doh. So we'll use Play-Doh in different ways just to get them really excited about engaging in those spaces. And then the last essential question we ask ourselves is how do children manipulate the materials? And as an occupational therapist, I know that there's a wide range of um, materials that they're doing. So um, we'll offer, oftentimes in our toy area, we'll offer small Legos as well as the bigger Duplos. So children can feel that they can access those things when they're building and not feel frustrated if they have fine motor, um, more fine motor challenges. And I see that we are closing in on time. So um, I'm just gonna go through these slides. When we chose um, different musical instruments, we look at how children would grasp them, um, seeing, you know, having the whole hand to grasp or having the ring around or just a longer stick, just a lot of different ways that children can hold things. Um, and then again, really looking at the indoor and outdoor spaces and what they're exploring. Yeah. So when we're talking about um, how they're exploring, a starting point for us is their five senses. You know, we look at these areas and we ask ourselves, what do they see? What do they hear? What do they feel? And of course, with COVID, it's so hard now to ask them, what do you taste and what do you smell with your masks on? We we don't want them putting things in their mouth. And we used to do that before COVID, but now it's crucial to still have conversations with them to make them think and ask them, I'm wondering, can you think of something this might taste like if we have play food in the dramatic area and having them try to recall their past and connect it to familiar things. But starting with these five senses is a really important key um, for us. And in our science area, um, you can see that we bring in different things, specifically trying to appeal to their different senses. On the far left, you see that we brought in natural materials like feathers, sticks, stones, spiked seed pods. And on the far right, you see different textured and colored gourds. And we bring in seasonal items that are light, heavy, soft, rough, colorful, dark. We want them to explore. We want them to look and, to, and we ask them. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What can you feel? And it gives us an opportunity to learn and make observations. And then we, I, go, so go ahead. Um, and then we, you know, what supports do we need to embed into our learning areas to also help the adults in this space? 
this is a child driven area, but we want to give content for our undergrads as well. And so in our block area in the next slide, you'll see that we had this, these are pictures taken straight from our classroom and the block area will have math concepts and vocabulary like height and gravity and pull and uh, you can zoom in and see all the different words on here that we have that we call them juicy words and we want the undergrads to bring in big words to help the children understand like this is heavy and weight and talking about these concepts and on the right we have a sheet that is a lot for the adult use but with the child direction and asking them what do you see and, and having them try to draw it and having an adult dictate it so that we know and what do they think what do they wonder these are questions we ask a lot what do you see, think, and how does it make you wonder about other things as well? And in other areas, and all of our areas have things like, welcome to the science area. Here is the purpose of this space. Here is what we expect to see. And here are some open-ended questions. What do you observe? We don't want to ask them yes or no, because a yes is not going to start a conversation. It's not going to get them thinking. And we tell them too, what is a scientist? You're a scientist. They, they make observations daily. They ask us questions and we want them to know that they are little scientists in our classroom. And we have these um, papers hang throughout to help the adults in the space know the expectations and what we really intend since everything is very, very intentional. And you'll have access to these slides. So we are going to just this was our next, um, how we created our most recent um, learning areas um, using real tools, um, again, vocabulary builders, um, and then exploring um, different concepts of weight, both in our grocery area as well as in our math area. But we want to go to the Q&A, and I did see in the chat, um, are we using the classroom assessment scoring system? Um, Ruth, we do use that um, once a year to, in the spring. So, yes. And we wanted to open it up for questions. We do have five minutes left. Um, if you want to put them into the chat um, or ask, unmute yourself and ask them. Um, if I may ask, uh, what curriculum are you guys using? Because we use the created curriculum. So I was just wondering what curriculum were you implementing in, in your environment? Yeah, so we use, we draw from a lot of different um, curriculum and research-based approaches when we're designing our spaces. So we're not tethered to just one. Um, we do use both um, more open-ended um, materials as well as some um, fine motor um, curriculum. So um, we use learning without tears and aspects of that for our older preschool cohort. Um, so we use, a, we draw from a variety of different ones. Also, I just wanted to say real quick that there is a link I put in the chat for just a survey feedback of this um, breakout session. If everyone could hit that link and um, give them some feedback. That'd be amazing. Yeah, thank you.